Are we ready to start? Yes. Yes. 7 o'clock, we're pretty good, right? Yes. Uh, I'm Mayor Galena, uh, and I do want to thank you for coming here. So, as the proud mayor of Monroe Township, I always certainly like to tout our safe community. It's something that you probably see in the Monroe news that comes out, or if I'm out and about, and I always tout one of the, not only the safest towns in the state, but, but also in the United States as well. And that's, that's a team effort. Now obviously it starts with our police force, which I think is, is top notch. And I think it's also so very important that we support our police um, administratively, financially as well. Um, but it also takes a team effort. And for I want to congratulate you for coming here because this is part of the team that helps prevent crime. Um, we've seen an uptick of crime nationwide, um, and it's a byproduct of the pandemic, but also a byproduct of the, I guess, the overall legal system. It's just easy for somebody to just come and steal something potentially get caught, and then they're out on the road again the next day. But we can combat that with what we're doing here. Um, the team effort approach, also recently, uh, the township has started the process and ordinance to uh, punish bad actors who come onto your premises. So one extra added layer of a penalty for nefarious acts. So that's something else that we're, we're, we're doing as well. Um, I do want to say that I've, I've been out with the police trying outreach like this because it's important to be informed. With information comes the power to act. And the words of see something and say something are never more strong as we have to combat the bad actors that find their way here to, into Monroe Township. Um, so tonight we're going to talk about um, scams, um, but also defending yourself by seeing something and saying something, and giving you the power which will help combat crime. Um, I, you know, if you're here regarding the scams. Uh, I can't emphasize enough, again, with that see something and say something. Um, just recently, I was, my mom just turned 90, uh, but a few months ago, uh, you know, I went to go have lunch with her, and she says, oh, oh, how's the little mayor thing going, Sonny? <laughs> like, mom, it's going good, you know? She goes, so what are you doing? And it just so happened I was out with Officer McCann doing a presentation. I'm like, Mom, I said, you know, I said, we've been going out and about trying to inform the citizens, especially the seniors, in regard to phone scams. She goes, oh, I know. I never answer the phone. I'm like, good, Mom. I trust you. She goes, oh, yeah, I had something. She lives up in Woodbridge. They had a very similar program. She goes, oh, they said, just don't answer the phone. And I don't answer the phone. I'm like, I'm glad, Mom. Well, I'm sorry this happy story is going to take a turn. In a moment of weakness, the phone was ringing, and she decided to answer it. It was someone claiming to be her grandson, who happened to live in Maryland, and the same M.O. that you'll probably hear, Grandma, I'm in trouble. I got into a car accident. I hit a pregnant woman and she's hurt, and I need to get money to get out of jail, um, and, you know, I need to get money from the lawyer. Please don't tell my dad. Please don't tell anybody. Just pulling on the heartstrings. And that resolute mom, right? I don't answer the phone. All of a sudden now, it's, what, what's she going to do? So she doesn't have a credit card. She didn't give the credit card information, but the bad actor said, could you go to the bank? My mother, 89 years old at the time, with a walker. 
didn't call any of her sons, but called a neighbor. Could you please take me to the bank? She went to the bank, took out $9,000 in cash, came back to the house, called the lawyer, and the lawyer sent a courier to her front door, rang the doorbell, my mother opened it, handed over the cash, and that was the end of it. Just like that. In that one moment of weakness. Now, you know, again, we, you, what, what could we have done? Well, maybe if she just called somebody. Or, again, if, if the neighbor just kind of asked a question. What? Why are you going to the bank? You know, see something, say something, question. So please, pay close attention to this. This is so important to give you the power to help part of the team. Um, before we start, I do want to recognize we have our Councilwoman Rupa Siegel here. And we have, again, members of our, of our police force who will be introduced separately. But it's my honor and privilege to recognize Officer McCann. Um, you're going you're gonna to love this guy. He, he is just passionate about this. And please, be part of that team that does the right thing, see something, say something, question. And you have the power, we all will have the power to fight crime. Thank you. Can I try this out first, and if I'm too loud, you can yell at me to get on the mic? Uh, I promise you, I got the inside voice and the outside voice. Um, I'm Officer Patrick McCann, I'd just like to thank Mayor Galena, Mayor Galena and then Chief Viennes. Uh, we would not be here without either one of those. Um, I'm just going to start with the formal introduction to so who we have here. We have Detective Lieutenant Saloon, Detective Sergeant Bruce Wink, we have Detective Gentili, and Detective O'Brien. So I'm lucky enough to have all of them here tonight. Um, they're my backup if I need any. All right. Um, I just want to get started by just kind of going off what uh, Mayor Galena said, is that we are very much passionate about this because we are trying to help you out. Um, it kind of shows you with the uh, showing that we have tonight. Um, usually I am by myself, but we have four other very good looking officers with me as well, okay? Um, I know I look very young, but I promise you I'm very smart, and by the end of this, you're definitely going to see So just to get started is some definitions. The U.S. Department of Justice defines identity theft and identity fraud as terms used to refer to all types of crime in which someone wrongfully obtains and uses another person's personal data in some way that involves fraud, deception, or typically for economic gain. Those last two words are the key words. It's always for money. It's never out of the kindness of their heart, it's always out of money. How do they operate? Many of them operate internationally. That next bullet point hammers that home, which makes apprehension very difficult. Is that now there is technology out there that, you know, have you ever heard of spoofing a telephone number? Where you could spoof an IP address. And that IP address is that computer's telephone number. So yes, it might ping back to somewhere in California, but before that, it pinged back to three other different countries. So when, if you were ever to become a victim of fraud, which I hope you're not online, it is very hard to track all of that down. Many use leading questions and wordings to gain trust. So I'm going to go over a variety of scams and frauds. They all try to get you to act off of an emotion. Whether it's empathy, whether it's love, whether it's um, you being scared, they're trying to scare you into it. They're all trying to get you to act off of an emotion. These are the top 10 fraud categories, and I know there's a lot of numbers here, but I want you to look at the outliers, okay? What I see is that imposter scams, number one, 645,000 reports, and these are all from uh, 2019 stats, because I think that was the most, the, the last normal year. 2020, 2021, and even some of the 2023 have been skewed because of COVID. 2019 is the last uh, I think we're the most up-to-date stats uh, of normal life. So 645,000 reports of imposter scams. 
only 13% of them reported a loss. But that 13% attributed to almost half a billion, or over half a billion dollars. The other outliers that I look for is the medium, the median loss. So imposter scan, 650, but if you look down at foreign money offers and fake checks, it goes up to $1,500. Because so they're not looking just for one or $200 at a time, they're looking for substantial amounts. Who it impacts most and why we do what we do. Approximately 51% of Monroe is over the age of 55. And if you see the red bar in the bar graph, you can see exactly who it impacts most. So that 60 to 69 age range is who it impacts most. These are fraud reports by contact method. So how the fraud is initiated. Overwhelmingly, it is initiated by phone calls. If we can try to educate you into how to stop these unwanted calls from coming, or to educate you into recognizing a fraud or a phone scam, we're going to cut that 61% down, hopefully by a big chunk. By majority, it is started by the phone. My advice to you is simply, if you do not recognize the number, do not answer. I try and abide by that same thing. If it's that important, they'll leave a voicemail. After that is text, email. Big thing is what we're trying to get down is the phone scams. So these are fraud reports by payment method. So how the victim is giving away the money, or how they are being convinced to give away the money. Up top, we have wire transfer. Wire transfer is giving somebody your banking and routing information. While we're all sitting in this room, that sounds impossible. Because if I asked you right now, What's your bank account number? You wouldn't give it to me. But what they have you do is they're trying to get you to act off of an emotion. And then when you're acting under stress, the longer they keep you on the phone, the more likely you are to give away some kind of information. Okay? So what is the cost? In 2019, 1.7 million reported identity frauds nationwide. Out of those, 23% reported a monetary loss. Those 23%, that is a $1,862,000,000 net loss. And that is $293 million of an increase from 2018. As technology advances, so do these frauds. These are the types of identity theft and fraud that we're going to be going over. There are also pamphlets on the table as you measure or enter. Most of those are also in there. This entire PowerPoint is available on our website. So like Mary Delina had said, so it's not just a grandchild scam, it could be a son or daughter scam as well. A grandchild scam is what we see the absolute most. And Mary Delina, unfortunately, his mother had been through the same exact thing. Or well, it is started by a phone call. The caller will pretend to be a family member and will ask leading questions in an attempt to gain your trust or an attempt to uh, pretend to be one of your grandchildren, one of your grandchildren. So you get a phone call. It will start off, Grandma, Grandpa. Then you would list what whoever you thought, whatever grandchild you thought it was. They're looking to assume that identity. So if you say, Billy, is that you? You just gave them Billy. Because they're going to pretend to be Billy for the rest of that conversation. And then they're going to go on, Grandma, Grandpa, unfortunately, I've been arrested out of state. This complete misunderstanding. The cops thought I was drinking and driving. I really wasn't. You know I wouldn't do that, Grandma, Grandpa. Then you go on for a little bit. The key is, they're going to ask for money for bail. They even might do it officially or try to gain your trust even further or to make it seem legitimate by saying a court courier will come to your house. Or they <coughs> might transfer you to what, uh, or a jail guard or someone within the court system to try and make it sound even more legitimate. But then they're going to walk you through steps into either you sending a wire transfer to them or for you going out and purchasing gift cards and then reading off the gift card numbers to them. 
This is one that I hate the most. I don't like any frauds, but I picture my grandma becoming a victim of this fraud, and it really makes me mad. Because they're, this fraud, they're trying to get you to act off of your love for your grandchildren. And I know all of you would, just like I would when I have grandchildren. But please be aware of this, okay? Uh, this next slide is a video. I'm not going to play the video for time's sake, but I definitely I encourage you to go onto our website and watch the video. IRS scams are very common during tax season, which is coming up. A person purporting to be an IRS agent will conduct or contact the individual and claim that he or she is an agent with the IRS and that the individual has any of the following. Unclaimed taxes, a warrant out for the rest, or multiple social security numbers. We see this one a lot. So you get a phone call from an IRS agent. That IRS agent will let you know that your social security number has been used in multiple states and has even been used to maybe rent a car. That car has been involved in a multitude of crimes. You are responsible for the tab of all of that. Responsible for the tab of the rental car, responsible for all of the credit card charges on whoever opened up a uh, credit card in your social security, in your name. You're responsible for all of those payments. If you do not pay that, the U.S. Marshals will be at your door tomorrow and it'll be placed under arrest. So they're trying to get you to act off of fear of being arrested, which is absolutely scary, but I want you to know that is a scam. Okay? Somebody calls you saying that you have warrants out of Texas. That's not how that works. Down at the bottom, the italicized, the IRS does not initiate contact with taxpayers via email to request personal or financial information. This includes any type of electronic communication such as text messages and social media channels. It's going to be official from the IRS. And just a side note, they might try to legitimize um, their self. They might try and give you a badge number. They might send a picture of their badge. All of that is photoshopped or made up, okay? If you ever are afraid, or you ever receive a phone call and you're afraid that somebody, or that you have a warrant out for your arrest, but you have never been to that state, please just take a second, contact a friend or a family member. Please, please, please. Because right in that state, you're going to be, your adrenaline's going to be up, you're going to be fearful that you're going to be arrested, but please contact somebody else, okay? Take a second to contact a friend before you send any money. They're going to try to legitimize it as much as they possibly can, but I promise you it is fake. <coughs> Up front, you will never see that hundred million dollars. 
they're looking for an upfront payment for the taxes and fees associated with your winnings. Uh, one of the another core or main reasons why I do what I do is that we had a detective who actually handled this case. This was before I was here, but this case hit, really does hit home for me. Um, we had a resident in our town, like I said before my time, she had been a victim of a lottery scam. She was contacted by um, a representative with the Jamaican lottery that she had won the Jamaican lottery. She had never played the Jamaican lottery, but she thought she was lucky enough that she had won. Okay? Over the next few months, she sent almost $250,000 of her own money, hard-earned money, to these perpetrators in Jamaica. Okay? She was coerced the entire time. We need more. You have to pay this. It's this kind of fee. It's that kind of fee. It's an international fee now. That had racked up to $250,000. She did contact the police department and she contacted us once. And she contacted us because the perpetrators had said, okay, we're going to be making a visit to your house. There are going to be armed guards who come to your house to be an escort for the courier. At this time, she didn't think she was a victim of fraud or a scam. She was concerned that somebody with a gun was going to show up. So she was concerned about the armed security that she was going to show up with the courier. So she contacted the police department. The detective bureau immediately got on the case and recognized that it was a scam or it was a fraud. A lot of scam. They set up a sting operation. Unfortunately, it was all aroused to get her to send more money. No, uh, more money. Nobody showed up. We had to try to explain to her that, man, you're, you're a victim of identity theft. You're a victim of a fraud. This is all a scam. You're sending money that you will never see. You're not going to get the $100 million or whatever she was promised from the Jamaican lottery. Her family was contacted. Her family tried to convince her that it was a scam. She didn't listen. Unfortunately, she realized that she had dwindled away her life savings and her kids' inheritance, and she ultimately took her own life. She drove her car to Spring Lake and walked out into the ocean. Okay. Uh, it still gives me the goosebumps every time I tell this story. Um, so this is one of the main reasons that I do what I do, because I hope that at least this sticks with you. And please, it is too good to be true. A lot of it. Romance scams, to move on. Scammers develop a relationship with an individual via direct messaging applications such as Kick, WhatsApp, and Facebook Messenger. If you don't recognize the first two, don't worry about it. If you recognize Facebook Messenger, that's exactly that. The individual professed their love quickly without ever meeting in person. The caveat again is that there's always some kind of emergency on the other end. I'm stuck internationally. I can't get home. I want to see you. I cannot get home. Or there would be a family emergency that somebody in their family needs surgery. And I know that you love me. Please help me out so I can help my family. They're looking to get you to send them money and then you will never hear from them. And sometimes what we see is the phishing scam as well, is that um, my name is Patrick McCann, and then Detective Jake O'Brien over there wants to scam somebody with using my name. So he creates a Facebook profile that says Patrick McCann, has all my information, has all my pictures, but it's really not me behind the keys, it's him. He could then contact friends and family of mine and ask them to send him money. My family and friends think they're sending money to me, but in reality, it's going to him. So be very careful if anybody's asking you for money over social media, okay? Check with family and friends before you send anything. Vacation scam, uh, vacation scams go hand in hand with lottery. I don't think we're that lucky, okay? Um, it's similar in the sense of you've been promised a free vacation, but before you can go, you have to pay the taxes and fees associated and would you believe it or not, those taxes and fees are probably in the form of gift cards. If you hear gift cards, please have all of those alarm bells going off in your head. Gift cards are for gifts, for family and friends. That is it. If you ever ask for the form of payment in a gift card, <coughs> alarm bells going off. That's a scam. Uh, this is the first in-person scam. This is a home improvement scam. 
Uh, this, an example of what I had a few years ago is that um, a resident in our town had hired a contractor off of Craigslist. The contractor showed up, really didn't do the diligent research, didn't do his due diligence and research beforehand. That contractor was fake. He did not know it at the time. He had created a fake business, had an address in Newark. When we ended up looking up at that address at the end, it didn't exist, it was a residence. But what had happened is that that contractor that he had hired had showed up to his house on a scheduled date. He had produced a letterhead to make it look official with a contract. He signed, homeowner resident signed, great. What had happened is that after the estimate, oh, uh, there's something wrong with the cabinets. I need another $2,000. They're looking for you to pay for an upfront promise or upfront for a promise. So what they ended up doing is they ended up getting $10,000 out of him. And not only that, they ended up destroying his kitchen where they came in and tore apart his kitchen. Like they were working, got paid, left, were supposed to come back, obviously, to finish the work, never did. So that homeowner resident was out of $10,000 and all the damages to his kitchen. Uh, mortgage or debt relief scam, this is, uh, this is initiated by an automated telephone call or email. The caller will claim that they work with your lenders, your banks, to significantly lower your payments. Loan modifications or debt relief. After you provided that information, they will either disappear or they will claim to need a deposit. They will ask you for your personal information before you begin. Sometimes even your financial information. I'm not giving any financial information over the phone. If you're asking for your social security number over the phone, I don't feel comfortable with that. If you're asking for your banking information over the phone, I don't feel comfortable with that. I'd rather do it in person at a bank. A charity scams, this is getting you to act off the most empathy. So this is very common after natural disasters. And this is not to dismay you or dissuade you from donating to charitable causes or charitable organizations. I encourage that and implore you to do your research beforehand though. Donate to a Red Cross. Don't, don't donate to something you see on Craigslist or um, maybe if you can see a link on Facebook, do the extra research afterwards. Make sure your money or your donation is going where you've intended it to. Can you hear me now scam? This is a more recent scam. You will get a phone call. It might be quiet on the other end. Or they might say, can you hear me now? So it's going to start with almost an awkward silence. And then they're going to pretend that they have a bad connection. Can you hear me now? What they're looking to do is to get you to say yes. They would then record that conversation and then record, have, they record you saying yes. Or even you saying your entire name. They would then use that to try and get into everything possible. Your banks by the automated telephone. So they're looking to get you to say yes or even your name. They record that. And what they're looking to do is then gain access to your accounts with voice authorization. And again, down at the bottom, most important thing, best course of action to avoid this scam is to either not answer calls from telephone numbers that you don't recognize, or please just simply hang up. The secret mystery shopper scam, this is the most in-depth one that I've seen, is that you get a letter in the mail that you have accepted a or you have gotten a job that you never applied for. <laughs> Again, I don't think we're that lucky. So, uh, the, the victim of this scam was a few years ago as well, and he had received a letter in the mail. He had gotten a job that he had not applied for. This job was to go to CVS, Walgreens, Best Buy, Target, and purchase gift cards. Then, when he got home, he was to rate the gift card customer service checkout. So what had happened is that he was sent a $2,000 check. He deposited that $2,000 check in his bank account. He then went and bought $2,000 worth of gift cards. He got home, he called his employer, gave them all the gift card numbers, and then rated the gift card customer service checkout. He did the work for him, because all the perpetrator now knows where to send his next victims. 
what had happened is that the next day that $2,000 check bounced and that $2,000 came out of his account. Email compromise scam is pretty easy. Down at the bottom, you might not, you might not be able to tell at a quick glance. But this whole scam is just making sure that your email username is the same as you originally created it. And that you're receiving emails, your usual normal emails, that you're still receiving them. If you are not, check your username and make sure it has not changed. Because that a hacker sometimes, if you look down at the bottom, you said John Doe at email.com. The one beneath it has two eyes in it. All future emails will go be forwarded to that new account. So this is something that you can prevent, but be aware of your email username and that you're still receiving usual emails. Okay? If not, inquire a little bit more about it. The FBI lock screen. What happens is that this pop-up pop up ad will appear on your uh, laptop, computer, tablet, and the, they will claim that the FBI has locked your computer. You won't be able to exit out of this. This is a virus that was implanted on your computer. Down at the bottom, you can't see the fine print, but what it is, is this ad will claim that you have to pay the FBI in the form of gift cards <laughs> to unlock your computer. Like I said, if you see gift card, please have those alarm bells going off in your head, okay? The FBI is not going out, oh, I hope not, is not going out and locking any of our devices, okay? This is a scam. This is a virus that's on your computer. What I advise you to do, shut this off, don't pay anything, and then take your computer, tablet, whatever, to a trusted computer professional. This next one, I'm sure all of you have seen this at some point. So these would be pop-up ads, and as many as times as you exit out, the more pop-up. What they're looking to get you to do is to click on the link within the pop-up ad. As soon as you click on that link within your pop-up ad, they might ask for your personal information, telephone number, or email. They can fix your computer because your computer is doing this. They even planted a virus on your computer. They caused this. They're looking to get you to click on the link to either gain access to your computer or get your personal information so they can call you. I had a scam a few years ago where this had happened to him. He clicked on the link, he contacted the person on the other side. It was supposed to be a computer repair technician, it was not, it was somebody looking to scam him. That person hacked into his computer. Or actually, our victim actually walked him through the steps of gaining access to his computer. He then was able to watch him on his webcam. He got up, he was on the phone for seven hours. He got up multiple times, he would then receive a phone call, please get back to your computer, sit in front of your computer, we need to fix this. I got in there, he let me know that he's been a victim of fraud or a scam, and they're watching this right now. I do not like that. So I immediately ripped the computer, uh, I ripped uh, the cords out of the wall and shut off his computer. It all starts with clicking on the link. In one, of the, in one of these pop-up ads. Please, if you see this, there's a virus on your computer, your computer's been compromised, shut it down, take it, take it to a trusted computer professional. Uh, I spoke about the phishing scams before where it's somebody reporting to be someone they're not. Even websites. Make sure that if you're shopping, you're shopping on Macy's.com, you're not shopping on uh, Macy's.worldwide. Make sure you're shopping on the website that you intend to shop on. And that you're visiting pnc.com. You're not visiting pnc.worldwide. Make sure you're visiting the websites you intend to. The ATM skimmers, this is physical. This is a physical scam in a sense of this is something that affects you with every ATM. My advice to you is to use trusted ATMs. I consider trusted ATMs ATMs that are either inside of banks inside their vestibules. I don't encourage you to use an ATM on the side of a 7-Eleven and train. I want you to use an ATM that has cameras on it. Okay? This is what it looks like. So these are adaptions that are on the face of ATMs. So I don't want you to never trust an ATM again. I just want you to be aware of using trusted ATMs. The ones in banks, 
the ones in maybe CVS's or pharmacies, just be careful. If you see any, what it looks like, aftermarket adaptions, just beware. Social security theft, please, your social security cards, keep them in a safe location. Don't keep them in your wallet. If you lose this, somebody could either create a new identity for you or assume your identity. Social security cards, keep in a safe place. If that number is compromised, your whole identity could be. And then shortly before I finish up, how it impacts us here in Monroe. In, 2000, uh, in 2011, or since 2011, I'm sorry, frauds have increased 267%. In 2011, 185 frauds were reported. In 2019, that number jumped up to 679. That's all because of change. As technology advances, so do these perpetrators who are looking to get money from you. This one through 10 are in the packets that I gave you. Uh, simply spot imposters. I'll go over it just very briefly. Um, if you did not grab one of the pamphlets, they're over there on the table as you go out. Uh, spot imposters, they often pretend to be somebody that you love, that you trust. Take the time, call your family members, call a friend. Don't just get the, uh, don't act off the emotion at the time. Do your online research. Please don't believe your caller ID, they can spoof the numbers. Don't pay upfront for a promise. Pay at the end after you received it, just like you would at a mechanic or something along that nature. Pay after the service has been done. Consider how you pay. I consider credit cards the safest uh, payment method because you could always dispute uh, that charge before it is actually sent. So you have that credit card, you, you bought something on the first of the month, your credit card is not due to the end of the month until you actually have to pay it. It gives you a, a larger leeway where you could fight or dispute that claim if it is in fact fraudulent. Cash and debit cards, that money, as soon as you send it, that's gone. Talk to somebody, like I said. Hang up on robocalls. These calls are illegal unless you've signed up to get them. Please hang up. Uh, do not deposit a check and wire money back. It's very similar to money laundering. And then, like I said, this is in the pamphlets that I have uh, given out. So now I would like to introduce uh, Detective O'Brien and Detective Gentile. Okay, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Uh, that's some really important stuff. Um, impacting throughout the country, throughout the state, right now. Um, so take the, I, I know we chuckle a little bit that we'll never get frauded or be a victim of it, but it happens very quickly. It will call you nonstop a hundred times, and they will, it's their job, they're professional frauders. So just take it very seriously. We hope you spread that information throughout your communities, through your neighbors. You know, we have to become a community of strength in terms of look after your neighbors. When they call, hey, can you bring me to the bank, can you bring me to CVS to get these gift cards? You know, you're educated now, say, hold on, no, let's call the local authorities and claim it from there. These some scammers also, they will deter you from calling the police that, that were involved in it. Um, that is not true. We're not frauding anyone. So just please call us. Um, the next thing we're going to talk about here is crime prevention. Um, it's been an uptick throughout the country and throughout the state in motor vehicle thefts, high-end vehicles, motor vehicle burglaries, residential burglaries. And we're going to go through a uh, PowerPoint here. And we'll, we'll hold all questions to the end. Answer all your questions from the fraud uh, presentation and the crime safety one. Just wait to the end so we can get through everything and we'll go from there, okay? All right, so we're going to start off with the burglary definition because that's what we're seeing the most of recently. You guys on Facebook, you've been seeing a lot of it in all Facebook groups of the uptick of burglary and motor vehicle deaths. So, according to the FBI's Uniform Crime Reporting, uh, the UCR, which is the uh, FBI's division that uh, creates all the statistics nationwide for all these types of crimes. It defines burglary as the unlawful entry of a structure to commit a felony or theft. To classify an offense as a burglary, the use of force to gain entry need not have occurred. The UCR program has three sub-classifications for the burglary. Forcible entry, so that's when somebody knocks your door off the hinges. 
unlawful entry where no force is used, so your door is unlocked, they just walk right in, and attempted forcible entry. So they try to knock your door in, but your deadbolt stops it, and they don't get in, and they just walk away. The UCR definition of a structure includes an apartment, barn, house trailer, houseboat, and when used as a permanent dwelling, office, railroad car, stable, or vessel. So this specific, these statistics that we're going to talk about do not include motor vehicle burglars. These are the statistics according to the UCR FBI as of 2019. That's the most uh, up-to-date uh, statistics that are up to date right now. In 2019, there were an estimated 1,117,696 burglaries a decrease of 9.5% when compared to 2008 data, 2018 data. The number of burglaries decreased in 29.6% when compared with 2015 data, and was down 48.5% when compared to 2010. Burglaries accounted for 16.1% of estimated number of property crimes, and by subcategory, 55.7% of burglaries involved forcible entry, 37.8% were unlawful entries, and 6.5% were attempted forcible entry. Victims of burglary offenses suffered an estimated $3 billion in property losses in 2019. The average dollar loss per burglary offense was about $2,661. Burglaries of residential properties accounted for 62.8% of burglary offenses. According to the FBI, a home burglary occurs every 15.4 seconds in the United States. Alright, so we're going to talk about entry points that burglars go through. Most people think the front door, the back door, the garage. Here are some of the stats here um, that show that. What we're seeing now is a different trend of burglary. We're seeing more second floor windows. Okay? They have these little thing ladders called the little giant. It's a 20 foot ladder and it packs to about this big. So we're seeing that. We're seeing burglars use outside patio furniture, chairs, pool ladders, getting to these higher up windows to make entry because what was the norm? Second floor is safe. No one climbs up there, right? But these guys are getting innovated, they're getting trickier, and that's what we're dealing with right now throughout the state and country. So this is the percentages, but also the second story windows and stuff has jumped as well. And a big focus point why we're jumping to the second story. So typically everybody, a lot of people have alarm systems in their house. When you get it installed, we focus on the first floor. Nobody really focuses on the second floor of the house, somebody can get up there. But they're utilizing those ladders to get up there and they're capitalizing on, I guess, our ignorance, right? We don't have sensors on our second floor. We're sleeping at night. We're up there. We hear stuff. So a lot of people don't have sensors on their second floor windows. That's why they're using that. So you don't even get alerted that they're in your house until they're gone. So first type of burglary we have, it's a distraction burglary. All right, so this is an in-person that you're actually physically home at the house. Suspect, uh, subject will pose to the contractor or public utility service, tree service. Some sort of solicitor, they might come around with a yellow jacket saying that they're selling a service, distract you. Know that you're the only person home. They're going to knock on your door and they're going to distract you by taking you outside or have you take them to another part of the house, knowing that you're the only one home. Okay? At this time, while you're occupied speaking with them, giving them information, talking to them, the second suspect that, unbeknownst to you, is around back of your house. They are now in communication and they're giving alerts to that other person. While you're unaware that there's somebody in the backyard, that second suspect is entering your house, they're inside your house during that five minute period that you're talking to that individual, and you come back inside after you're done, you don't want to buy this service, you come out and you realize, oh my gosh, my stuff is missing, my jewelry. You might not realize until a week later. They are very discreet and they use the distraction against you. So questions to think about when something like this happens. In Monroe, anybody that comes up to your door must have a solicitor badge, all right? You can contact the township. They have specific colors based on the year and the month. That's how we identify. So if you call the township, they'll say, hey, can you tell me what the solicitor badges are supposed to look like? And they'll show you a picture of what that looks like. And you don't be afraid to ask for somebody to show their badge. Because if they're not coming to the door, they shouldn't have that kind of. 
And if they don't, you can call the police department and we'll come out and we can address the situation. So questions to think about. Did you make an appointment? Or was this visit un unannounced? You could call the company to verify that this person is legitimate. Are they really from the solar company? Are they really from JCPNL? If you're unsure, call the police. Or don't answer the door. So we're just going to go over some, just, just a general rule of what, as the police department, as we respond, as what we want from you guys, right? If your house has an alarm system, please use it. Arm it. Every time you leave the house, even if you're going to the local pizzeria, get gas, arm it. You have it, you bought it, you pay for the service, please use it. Security cameras. Um, I know some people live in gated communities, some people live in regular neighborhoods, households. If you have any camera systems and they're not working, get them working. Frame camera, Nest, um, all these different services are out there. They're pretty user friendly. Um, if you're having a difficult time with it, um, there's videos online that will help you set it up. It's very discouraging when we go to calls for service or burglaries and stuff like that. And you see great cameras on the house, and you knock on the door, and the person's like, yeah, it hasn't worked for three years. <laughs> kind of a bummer. Um, that's a huge tool for us in terms of timing and stuff like that that we use. Um, so that's a big one. Locking all your doors. Second floor windows, second floor doors if you have them, storm doors, um, anything coming in, in and out of your house, lock it, deadbolt it. Um, that's a big one. Lighting, exterior lights. If you're going out Friday night, Saturday night, any day really, out to dinner, leave a light on. I know the, the older you guys may come after me, the older generation, they think leaving the light on might run the bill up a little bit. Um, it's 2023, the light bulbs will be okay. Leave a light on, leave a TV on. Um, it's a huge deterrent. It's a huge deterrent in the burglary field uh, when the lights are on. When the house is completely dark and it looks like no one's home, it's a great house to go to. So these are just little things we ask you guys have to do. Um, our township, the police department, we also have vacation notices. If you're going away for either one day or three months, uh, you can call the police department, the non-emergency line, say, hey, this is my address, this is the time period we're going to be away. Um, these are the only vehicles that should be in the driveway. Here's an emergency contact, a neighbor might be house sitting for us. That's the only people that should be at the house. That goes on to the patrol division, Patrol division each morning they get briefed on what houses are on vacation and they'll check the house, you know, pending call volume that day. Um, and we'll do an exterior check of the house to make sure no screens are ripped off the houses, everything's locked and secure. All we ask is that you give a, a good call back number. God forbid something does happen, we can contact you. Um, that's a huge tool. A lot of people use it um, and, and, and it's very useful. This is just an example. If you go on to the Monroe Township Police website, you go to your forms and permits, you'll see a tab that says vacation notice. It's all electronic, so you can do it right from your computer. It'll send, once it's completed, it sends it right to our uh, division, and then it gets dispersed to uh, the patrol division. Uh, call permitting, if we're not as busy, the guys and girls, they will go out and they will uh, check your house, check the exterior, just to make sure everything's okay. If you see something's off, we'll let you know. Also, when you go away on vacation, you have your trusted neighbors, give them a heads up. Hey, we're going to be away. If anything, just give an eye out on our house. If anything looks out of, the, out of place, please let us know. Try to refrain from social media. Um, bad criminals are on social media, so don't put it like, hey, I'm going away for two months to Italy. <laughs> see you guys soon. Um, you'll see this stuff. Um, it's very easy just to Google your name, your name to find out where you live and everything like that. So just refrain from that, and you know, also refrain from public, you know, saying where you're going for how long and stuff like that. Just trust the neighbors and inside your community. All right, so protecting your homes against burglars. So we're going to give you some steps on what you guys can do to protect your home and hopefully prevent these uh, crimes from happening. So like uh, Detective O'Brien said, exterior lighting, right? In general, criminals don't like, they're not a big fan of lighted areas. They want to stay in the dark, they don't want to be seen trying to get in and out without getting caught. The more lights, 
the more likely that they're going to be seen as a patrol officer driving down the street or one of your neighbors. So add exterior lights to your house and make sure they're, they're operational so we can see around the house. You want to lock your windows and your doors, deadbolts as well. A lot of people, oh, we're just running out of the store real quick, just leave it open. Leave the interior garage door open. That's no good no more. All right? We have to lock all our doors. Okay? Close your garage door. A lot of times we're driving around town at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, and you'd be surprised how many people leave their garage door open. As you've seen in the news, a lot of people are leaving their garage door open, and we have criminals that are going into people's houses to get their key fobs, to get their cars, all while you're sleeping. How do we prevent that? Close your garage door, lock your car. Okay? Practice social media safety. If you're going away on vacation, don't go and post it. Hey, have the best time of my life. The Rolex is in the top drawer. With the <laughs> All right? You know, just to touch on this thing uh, real quick. Um, it's one of the pet peeves of mine. Some of these houses we go into, um, there's no safes. If you carry large quantities of money, if you want to store front business or whatever it might be, if you if your person doesn't trust the banks, that's fine. And you keep large quantities of cash, high-end jewelry in your house. Buy a safe. And when you buy the safe, okay, this is key, deadbolt it into your house. Secure it into your house. Do not put $100,000 into a small safe and just put it in your closet. It does no good. Okay? And lock them and use them. The old days of putting money underneath comforters and in between clothes is over. These crooks and criminals, they're, they're very good at what they do. They're fast. They're extremely fast. They don't want to be inside your home very long. So if that safe is bolted to the ground and it's secured, they're not going to stick around for it. They're going to have to move on. If the security system's working, it's going to have to move on. They know the times it takes. There's not a alarm going off for the phone call from the central dispatch from the Burke to the police station and to our dispatch. They have it. They know it. Be within three or four minutes of burglary crews in and out of your house. That's how fast it happens. So that safe is a huge deterrent. If there's a big safe there, a small safe, and bolted, they can't get it, they're going to be out. Going out of the house, close your blinds and your curtains. Don't make it an open eye shot into your house that everybody can see what you have. Keep your valuables away, don't keep them out in the open. You want to add uh, install automatic interior lighting. So, now with technology advancing, there's a lot of different switches on Amazon, uh, Best Buy, you can get anywhere. Where you can plug something into an outlet, say it's a lamp, or just a hi-hat in your house, right? And you could say, I want it in away mode. And automatically it does an algorithm that'll just start randomly turning on and off. It makes it look like somebody's home in the house. This is a good deterrent to these criminals because they can leave somebody's home. I don't want to go in the house. We're going to go to the next one. Avoid advertising costly items. Buy a high value item, Rolex, a uh, really nice car, and you start flaunting it. Don't keep it out in the public, all right? Keep it within your circle. Don't be posting it on social media. These criminals are constantly trolling on social media using keywords, and they find, oh, hey, that looks like a really nice car. Let's look into this. They Google your name, and in two seconds, they have your address. And you got them there at your house that night. Eliminate hiding places in your yard. So if you have overgrown sh uh, shrubbery, trees, make sure you trim it down. You don't want to give them a place to hide if they are actively sneaking out of your house. Okay. Also, real quick, if you see vehicles parked up on the side, you know your neighbor's out of town, but they just went out to dinner, and you see a car in your driveway, you've never seen a car before, call us. Call the police department. Say, this is a suspicious vehicle, I don't know what's going on. Patrol officer will, will respond and check out what's going on. That's a huge key with the communities looking out for each other. Um, if you guys are our eyes and ears on the road. We cannot be everywhere within the community that we support. So, as it went back to the beginning, first line see something, say something. And we mean that. Do not be hesitant or nervous. And I don't want to bother the police or call. Those calls that you think that are the key factors in solving these crimes are effective. I'm telling you, it's, it's just, the stats are there. The little calls, hey, there's a car here parked up. Can someone check it out? And the leads to a huge case. And it's the citizens within the community looking at to each other, coming together. And the reason this works is because you guys know your community is the best, right? 
I can go into Rossmore and Clearbrook, and it might all look normal to me, right? I don't go in there as frequently as you guys are there every single day, right? But you know your street. You know what cars belong there. You know what people belong there. You see somebody, hey, who is that? Hey, shoot out a text. And, hey, is that your grandson? Does that person believe belong here? They don't? Okay, let's call the police department. The thing that kills us is we'll go a week later and we're doing campusing in the area to see if anybody saw something. Like, oh, yeah, you know what? I did see that person. I just, I just thought it was somebody's grandson. They just pushed it all the way. Right? And then we find out that six cars got broken into on that street and nobody reported it. But people, several people saw it. So if you see something, say something needed. Don't sit on it and wait on it. You're not inconveniencing us, that's what we're here for. And we want to be able to act quickly and be more effective to prevent these crimes and apprehend these criminals that are doing these things. So a precaution summary, just a little summary of everything that we went over. You want to make sure your home looks occupied and make it difficult to break in. You want to lock all your outside doors and windows before you leave your house or go to bed. And you want to make sure your garage doors are closed and locked them, and the interior uh, garage door is locked. Don't allow daily deliveries of mail, newspapers, or flyers to build up while you're away. You can arrange for the post office to hold your mail or arrange for a friend or neighbor to come and collect it. Uh, if you don't know how to deal with the post office, you can't go to the post office. They have a mobile application that you can. It's called Inform Delivery. So you can actually go in the app, and you say, hey, I'm going away from here to here, hold my mail, resume it on this day, and everything will come in a big packet. And you can also monitor what mail is going to be coming each day. So if you know you got a big check coming in one day, you'll know when it's coming, and you can keep an eye out. If it's missing, then we can take the next step from there. Arrange for your lawn to be mowed while you're going away. Don't let it overgrow and make it look like nobody has been here in a month or two. Check your locks on your doors and windows and replace them with secure devices if necessary. So a lot of times, a lot of us have uh, sliding doors on our back doors, and we just lock it, and then we go to bed. We recommend reinforcing that. Uh, you can get like little devices like pipes or some uh, security block that you can put in the slider. So, hey, the door, I, I can pull it. If I pull it hard enough, it's going to break that interior lock, and I can get in. But if you have that pipe in there, it's a hard boundary they can't get in, right? Push. Uh, buttons that uh, locks on doorknobs are easily opened by burglars. So you just your classic lock, I right, turn it, we're good. That's not good enough anymore. You want to put that deadbolt for that extra level of security. Uh, don't share your vacation plans on social media. Be a good neighbor. If you notice anything suspicious in your neighborhood, call 911 immediately. I recommend forming a neighborhood watch group. We can help you work with your neighbors to improve your security and reduce your risk of burglary. A lot of communities, they have WhatsApp groups, Facebook groups, text message groups that they'll post pictures or just shoot out a text. Hey, does anybody know what's going on? Keeps your community informed and you feel much safer. A lot of these apps with the video surveillance, uh, we're going to go into a little bit more, uh, like Granny, Nest, Harlow, they have communities within the community. So, for example, one that I'm familiar with is Ring. They have the Neighbors app, it's called. So if you have a video, you ring a doorbell, somebody's walking up to your door, you have no idea who this is, you could say, hey, does anybody know who this is? Send, and then post to the Monroe Township community. And then people could start communicating on that comment to you, say, hey, oh, I know that person came to my house. And then you start sharing videos, and that's how we start identifying. Okay, so it's a good tool that you can be aware of what's going on around you, and you work with your community if you don't have their numbers or those groups available. What do I do if your home is broken into? So if you come home to an unexplained open broken window or door, obviously we're going to be nervous, right? Nobody wants to come home to that. We do not recommend going into the house. We don't know if somebody's in that house. Obviously that door was not broken when you left. So we want you to pause, take a deep breath, do not enter the house, call 911, call a neighbor, and then call the police. Do not go into that house. Use your cell phone or a neighbor's phone to call the police. Do not touch anything or clean up until the police arrive. It might be stuff of evidentiary value. You can get some fingerprints. It might have dropped something that could help us out. These are all things that you'd be surprised. People are like, oh my god, the police are coming. My house is a disaster. We've got to clean up. <laughs> uh, that, that, hurts, uh, that hurts us, right? We're not going to judge. We'll wait till we go back to the police department to talk about how they're going to So you want to write down all your license plate numbers that you see of any suspicious 
vehicles. Uh, description if you can't get the license plate. Hey, there was a Dodge Caravan. I've never seen that car before. He was there, and as soon as I looked at him, he sped off. Really weird. That's a lead for us to go off of. Then we can start going to your neighbors and go off of that. And you want to know the descriptions of any suspicious person. You see a guy with a black hoodie, black sweatpants, and a COVID mask out, and it's 90 degrees in the summer. It's kind of weird, right? We're going to note that down, and we're going to let the police know when we get out there. So there's a couple things that are going on out throughout the state, throughout the country, high end motor vehicle thefts. Okay? They are targeting very high end vehicles uh, parked in driveways. Uh, there's a key thing that they look for, these high end vehicles when they lock, their mirrors collapse in. Okay, so these guys will just drive around, they see a high end vehicle and the mirrors are open. Okay, they just get out of the car. No cars unlocked, we'll either go through it, looking for personal items, wallets, keys, money, stuff like that, we'll take it and steal it. If you keep on in the car, we'll steal your whole car, right from your driver. Um, that is on the rise throughout the state. Um, it's being combated uh, the task force, state police, federal level stuff going on. Um, I'm sure you hear about the news, um, what's going on. Um, so we've got a lot to do us. So the transition to locking our doors, and the next thing is leaving your garage door clickers in there, they'll hit that, and then they'll go inside your house just to look for your keys. Um, so that's why that garage door vestibule area, you have to lock it. You have to lock it. But if you lock your door, your hardware, you won't have to wear it. You lock it. But that's the new trend now uh, we're seeing. These are young juvenile kids, most of them coming down from up north, and they're coming down and they're car shopping. That's what they call it, and they're looking for high-end vehicles. That's what happens. So if we can help each other out, lock each other's doors, car doors and stuff like that, motor vehicle burglaries, that's just plain and simple. Just lock your cars. Just lock your cars. It's that simple. Um, if you have a garage that can fit your vehicle in, use it. Um, make sure you shut the door. It. It's very simple. Mm -hmm. um, no one is smashing into stuff. Um, there is a couple trends going on throughout the state right now. There, there are follow-up burglaries slash uh, felony land burglaries. Okay. So if you have a pocketbook, okay, and you're going for a walk in the park, don't leave your pocketbook in the front seat. If you're going with the stop and shop, you just grab your wallet, and you leave your purse in the front seat, don't leave it there. Either put it in the back seat, tuck it down, put a coat over it, or put it in the trunk, or take it with you. Um, these people will drive around parking lots, they'll look into cars, they'll see, oh, here's the Louis Vuitton uh, handbag right here. You just watch her go up to stop the shop, she's in the produce aisle. They'll just hit your car with a glass break, and they'll take the purse, and they're gone. Now they have all your stuff. Um, from banks, if you're moving large quantities of cash or going to a jewelry store, okay, and you're not going directly home or to go make that payment, whatever it might be, do not leave that currency in the, the passenger area. Put it in your trunk. The trunk is safe, safer, okay? Going directly home and, doing, and putting it away in the safe is, is a good idea. Be cognizant around you when you're at a bank doing large uh, withdrawals or going there to deposit large amounts of money. If you're at a jewelry store, high-end clothing stores, Apple stores, these criminals are in these stores and they look like regular plain Jane people. There's no ski mask on them. They're just sitting there and they have these little Bluetooth earbuds in and they're saying, okay, the guy in the blue jacket just you know, took out $50,000 or he just bought five iPhones walks out the wall and you put it right into his passenger seat. Your window is going to get broken. And they're going to steal it and that's it. So these are things we, the people, have to start to be more cognizant of. They're very simple things. So just be out there looking around and that's it. And again, this is happening all over the place. It's not just happening in Monroe. It's happening throughout the state and the whole country. So be cognizant. 
We're moving on. What do I do if I'm a victim of motor vehicle theft or burglary? What are some preventive measures that we can take now to help the investigative purpose or help you in the, in the long run, right? So we recommend, so for example, with the felony lane gang, somebody smashes your car, they take your wallet. What's the primary purpose of that? They're looking to max out all those credit cards as quickly as they can before you notice. So the quicker you recognize, we have our handy dandy smartphones now, there's an app for everything, right? Know your credit card information. Create these apps, have these logins on your phone, and they make it so easy, all you have to do is press one button, locks your card, nobody can use that again. It's a criminal's worst nightmare. When people don't know how to use that, that's when they maximize on that, and they're getting away. They're going, said, I'm going to steal my Discover card. I'm going to go right to the 7-Eleven, I'm going to buy five $500 gift cards, American Express, and now that's clean money. I don't care about your card. I'm done for your credit card. Now I got clean money, untraceable, right? And they're going to keep doing that on every one of your credit cards, buy high value items, and they're going to wear a mask. Now in the day of COVID, it's impossible to, uh, to identify these people. Everybody looks the same, right? They're bought a hand to face. Our software to ID these people, it, it's not sufficient, right? So they're using that to their advantage. So the way you combat that is download these apps and be familiar with how to use them. Monitor them on a daily basis. I know back in the day we used to wait till our statement came at the end of the month and you checked and said, hey, this looks good, this looks good, this looks good. Unfortunately, that's the day and age that we're in, you gotta be monitoring it on a daily basis. I might be over the top, I do it every day and I check. I have alerts on my phone. Anytime a charge is made on my credit card, it sends me a text message and an email. Say, hey, did you make this charge? Makes you come back quicker and you can report it to those credit agencies and also report it to the police as well. Uh, if you have EasyPass, create an online account. All right, EasyPass is a great tool for us, especially with motor vehicle thefts. Uh, if your car is stolen, it'll tell us which route it took, whether it got the turnpike, got off the turnpike, parkway, so on and so forth. So it helps us track and go in the right direction where that car might be. You have OnStar, some vehicle tracking services, which a lot of these cars do. They do come at a premium. Uh, you do oftentimes get a free, free trial period with it. They are very beneficial and they will track your car. Just because it's in your car, if you don't pay for that service, they will not help you. They, it's not activated. So you can have OnStar in your car and the, the subscription just ended. Uh, you're like, oh, no worries, don't tell me where my car is. It doesn't work like that. It kind of gets put in an active file, but they don't maintain that. Another way around that, if you don't want to pay these big premiums, a lot of big trends that we've been seeing are air tags. Anybody ever hear of an air tag? It's uh, through Apple. Uh, it's a little, this little, it's like a little, uh, it's like a water bottle cap. And awesome. what they do, um, you can use that to track anything. So if I wanted to put one in my wallet, I lost my wallet, it has a sound sensor in there that I can activate it from my phone, and it will ring so I can find my wallet, right? What people have been doing, it's a cheaper alternative that costs like 50 bucks maybe. You can put it under your mat in your car and you can track that from your iPhone. And what it does, the way it gets signal, it doesn't have cell signal, but it pings off of any iPhone. So a lot of people have iPhones nowadays. You can drive on the turnpike, the car right next to you, they have an iPhone. It picks up that signal through Bluetooth and starts bouncing around and it gets, lets you maintain and, and monitor where that, uh, that vehicle is at that time. So just know that's uh, out there and that you can use that. Just a quick note on that. If you're driving and you're in your home and all of a sudden you're in your house and you start seeing a, it will come right up on your iPhone and you'll lose alert and you'll hear it. If you don't have an Apple AirTag, call the, call the police. Call the non-emergency line, let them know what you got, because criminals are using them against victims. Right? I have vehicles. We'll put them underneath the car. We'll put them in a gas tank where you don't see them, instead of a truck. Um, and they'll follow you home. We'll know where the car is. And we'll try to either come steal the car, or if you just came from the bank, or buying high valued items, they'll break into your house. So these are things that, and again, it's a day and age, right? Technology is a double edged sword sometimes. So there's pros to it, we use it as victims to track our stuff, and then the criminals are using it to track their victims. So just be cognizant of it, it will pop right up on your phone. Um, just be cognizant of it. That's a big new trend. Yes. Yeah. So this is something that we found, it's called a 9 p.m. routine, right? It's pretty simple. We should all start to adopt this and spread the word, right? 
what are we going to do? 9 p.m. comes every day. We're all ready to go up to bed. If we're not in bed already, maybe you do 8 p.m. We're going to lock all our ground floor doors and windows. We're going to empty our mailbox and make sure that we retrieve all the packages from the porch. Don't leave anything out in the open for somebody to just come up and take it. Remove valuables from your vehicles and lock them. Remember to close your garage doors and the deadbolt inside going into your house. Make sure your valuables, the valuables are not visible from the outside of your home. Five minutes every night can save you hours, days, weeks, months, or years of partying. Set your phone alarm for 9 p.m. every night and just be part of this 9 p.m. routine. It's the little things, it may be inconvenient at first, but make it a routine, it becomes a habit, and then we can, we can prevent it. So a program that we have at the police department, it's a voluntary security camera registry. So say uh, there's a burglar in your neighborhood, there's a lot to go through. Say in Rossmore, we've got thousands upon thousands of houses, right? We can only go to so many houses in a short period of time. So what this enables, if we people register for this, we can say, okay, we go into our database, we're like, all right, Rossmore, all right, we have all these people are registered, they have security cameras. I'm just gonna give them a call. They know how to monitor their system. Hey, can you check your time between 9 p.m. and 10 p.m. on Thursday night? Can you send me whatever videos look strange? We're looking for this, that, and the third. And that enables you guys to send it directly to us, and it gives us more time that we can do other investigative measures instead of going door to door and asking uh, for security cameras. So that's right on our website as well. If you go into the forms and permits, you'll see that uh, at tab. So another type of death is we have is deaths in the home. So these are your everyday deaths. A lot of us have uh, home health aides, uh, medical personnel that come in the house. As much as we'd love to trust everybody that comes in our house, cleaning people, whatnot, unfortunately some bad, bad acts out there, right? So in a large number of these deaths within senior communities, the home health aides are the prime suspects. Cleaning persons are also common. So they have free range your house while you're there. You're not even thinking anything of it. Some may gain your trust and use that to your advantage. They might be sick, stealing right under your nose and you have no idea. All right, so just be mindful. Do not tell anybody where your valuables are. All right, keep it to people that you trust. Don't go to your cleaning lady. Hey, don't clean that room. That's where all the money is. Or that's where all the jewelry is. I have my $20,000 diamond ring under the chair. Don't tell my husband. You're like, you, don't, you, don't want it. you don't want to share that, all right? Do not share the locations of cash anybody you do not trust. When you hire a cleaning company, do not use some random person on Craigslist, right? You want to use somebody that is word of mouth. A lot of us, hey, one neighborhood, they use the same person, five houses. Use somebody you trust, and that's validated, right? We want to do our research. Google them, see if they're legitimate. Don't just call somebody in the ad, hey, I clean house for $100, uh, today's special. Don't believe that. Even though you want the deal, don't believe that. Use a trusted, recommended service, re reviews. One, one other thing, too, back on the home health page and the, the cleaning services or pool services, whatever you guys have. Take down, if, if they're there once a week, twice a week, if, if you can, take down their license plate. It won't hurt. Take down their license plate, keep it in a notebook somewhere. God forbid something happens. It's a great way for us to start. It's a great way. The name is good. Sometimes these home health aides will give you a fake name um, and stuff like that. The license plate is, is a good start for us. So if you have a new cleaning lady come over, cleaning man come over, just take out the license plate. Real quick. That's it. And just put your valuables away. <clears throat> so as Officer McCann uh, explained before, this full presentation is online on our website as well with some videos as well and some other uh, resources that you can use. Just go into the information tab and everything's all well under there. Uh, do you guys have any questions? Okay. I have two fold questions. I live over three more. My question is, which one do you say is better? The timers on the lights or the sensors on the lights? Because during the day, I'm, I, I'm a walker. The lights are gone as I walk by the house. I know there's nobody in it. The light is and it, okay, I walk by it several times a day. I can tell you who's home and who's not just because the light went on. The light went on. It's during the day. There's no reason for the light anymore. And then my second one is, when is, you said, when you see something, say something. 
When is it too much to say something? Like, when do you start to be the, the nosy neighbor? When do you start to be the person that's just calling the cops all the time? I call the cops. You know, you call the cops. I know that there's people in, in my community that they're just waiting for somebody to just step wrong off a curb so that they can call the cops. So that's my two things. So, so, real, so real quick, with the timer and the motion thing, um, you're talking about your house, correct? Yeah. Okay. I'm, a, I'm a big motion guy. Um, the reason I say motion is you're sitting on your sofa and your light's already timed on and it's already bright. You don't know if someone's walking out there. A light on is not a, a catch-all. Crime can still occur. But if you're sitting on your sofa and it's 1 o'clock in the morning and that light clicks on and you see it, it's going to make you get off that sofa and go look. Or think, why is that light on? So I would do motion. That's my personal preference. Because if it's on a timer constantly, it's not going to do anything. That was sort of what I was saying, because people have the timers on. And they're all during the day, because they never change the timer on. <laughs> I hear you on that. I mean, if you want to tell them, go motion. Well, I'm I don't want to go tell them, because I'm afraid they're going to say, oh, you're trying to break into my house. Oh, no. <laughs> Um, the, the, the nosy neighbor thing, I mean, you guys know your neighborhoods. You guys know the vehicles on the block that should be there, should not be there. You, you, you got to use your judgment um, in a way. If you keep calling us 30 times a day for every car that drives by you, I might be coming to make a visit today. <laughs> a little refreshing. But if you're seeing stuff that's not normal, cars parked in between the houses, not directly in front of the house. You know what I'm saying? Halfway in, parked under not a light thing, sitting there for 10, 15 minutes. And these adult communities, right? You, no one sits in their cars. You're there for a purpose. You're going in your house, visiting someone in and out. No one should be sitting, really, for long periods of time. Um, walking around, getting back in their car, going back, stuff like that. That's huge. Even if it, it, if, you, if you see the cars and you read the license plates, write them down. It doesn't mean you have to call us, but just write them down. It's, it's, it's a self-judgment. You know, if you're building off that and you're worried about being a nosy neighbor, you're calling us all the time, you can call anonymous. A lot of people are afraid to call. Oh, no, not, my, not, not my house, not my problem. Or they don't want to be part of the headache. Or what's the problem? You don't have full ID. <laughs> we will respect. If you wish to remain anonymous, we will respect. If it goes like, hey, this house is getting burglarized, and you got five minutes, they're inside, and then we need to leave, we're probably going to go and track down your phone and try and come find you. But if you see something suspicious and you don't want, you can remain anonymous, we will ask to be anonymous. We will respect that. And if a, if a vehicle tries to jump with you when you're driving through, and a vehicle tries to come behind you and come along with you at a side entrance, something like that, that would set off my alarm bells. If it's Patricia who walks her dog every day at 9 a.m., don't call Patricia walking her dog at 9 a.m. I would call just like that. If a gate, if a car's trying to jump in with you when you go into one of those side gates, that's something like the picture of O'Brien. Well, the license plate, the license plate, the license plate. That's how you do all the time for your clear room. The Amazon guy sits and waits for a resident to Yeah. So if, right if, if it's if something for anybody, if it's an Amazon shipment during the day, that's that's annoying, but it's not as many as alarm bells. If you're coming home late, and there was a vehicle that was on the shoulder of the road and was waiting for a resident to come in, that's what I'm concerned about. That's where getting that license plate. Because if it's an Amazon delivery driver that's jumping a gate with you, I will let Clearbrook Security know. Because they're supposed to be doing laps as well. But if a car is parked in the shoulder with a slice hole at 12 a.m., and it just happens to pull right up behind you, and then you go in together, that's where my alarm bell is going off. Uh, I have a question. I, I was following a call into Concordia, where I live. And this car came in not by, um, not tailing behind me so close, but far away. He was able to get in somehow. And he followed me right to my door. And I called security, and security did not help me out. I 
question. Um, we're not going to get into the Concordia, I don't know their protocols and their policies as Concordia security officials, but I'll tell you this much. If you do feel that you're being followed, right, into your community, don't go home. Drive around the neighborhood, call the local authorities, where you might be. It doesn't have to be home. It could be to a mall, to a bank. Let them know what color vehicle you can see it, what kind of vehicle is following you. Yeah. Pull over in a lighted area, maybe you drive to the guard shack, put your hazard lights on, and wait for the local authorities. If you're not comfortable parking, just continue to go around the corner, and you'll stay on 911 dispatch with the police department until an officer, patrol officer, reaches you and we can figure out what's going on. You never want to go home, so a sense. You do a couple turns in the community and they're not there anymore. You know, it could just be paranoia, but if they're still behind you, give, give us a call. We're here for that. that that's why we're here. So some communities do have gate. Uh, some communities do have cameras, either near their gate or on their gates themselves. So maybe it's not every community, but I encourage you to inquire about whether or not your community has a camera on the gate or what gates, what kind of security features that they do offer. Because some of the communities that we do have in town have phenomenal camera systems, and some have just recently installed them. So I encourage you to inquire with your homeowners association, with your community, whether or not you have gates, or, next, or further possible options. Yes? I guess he could ask you, but he has no legal right to get it from you. 
Yeah, you might want to check on it. I think I'm right on it. I have a tip for people who get an impression of how people are. Yes. The tip is to ask the, the perpetrator a personal question, something like their birthday or what their parents' uh, name is, yeah. and uh, you'll get a hang of in a minute. I said, yes, what is my name? He said, yeah, I'm a child. Building on that, a lot of uh, what we've been talking to, how to say it for with grandkids. Yeah. All right, trouble word. So the code word is banana. You say, hey, what's the code word? They don't say the code word, click. All right? They use these open-ended questions to gain your trust, Keep you on your phone, get you disoriented, and before you know, you're on the phone three hours. Just real quick with that, just it's a great tip, sir. Just be skeptical because all it takes is them to know your name and the Google search engine, a quick search of your name. I can find out your whole family, your date of birth, and everything. These guys are good. So don't be tricked up when they call and they say Johnny's birthday is you know, June 2nd, 1993, and he lives at this address. You know, I'm in my bro, it's Johnny. Don't be tricked up when they know the answers to that. And they know your answers, they know your birthday. Um, because they do. They do. And it's very, it's just a Google search away. You Google your name online, you'll be very surprised what you find. They go on Facebook, they get pictures of you. They get those whole bunch. So, you're a member. Oh, you mentioned a lot of stuff that you have for
or make sure you're visiting the right website, log in that way. Never click on the link and log in. We're building off that. You don't have these smartphone apps, we're not technologically savvy. The best way to get the correct number, because a Google search is going to be the first thing. The most accurate number you can do, go on the back of your credit card, every credit card, debit card, has a contact number for customer service. Call that number, that's the trusted number. If somebody calls you asking for your information and you're worried about it, hang up, call back at that number that you know is a trusted number, and then proceed that way. Yes? We make copies of the front and back of every credit card and keep that at home. So if you ever do, you lose your wallet, you have all that information you have to call. And secondly, uh, navigation system, people shouldn't put their own address in. Yeah, so building, building off of that, I was going to touch on that a little bit. When you go out to these uh, restaurants, you have valet services. All they need to do, you don't know who's getting in your car. They press home, like, hey guys, nice Mercedes, hundred thousand dollar Mercedes just pulled up. Looks like they're an older couple that don't have any kids at home. This is where they live. Maybe you go check it out. Nobody's home, so it leaves you vulnerable. So don't keep that home address out of your GPS because that is a tactic that we have seen in the past. Uh, I'd like to ask you a question. No, it's a, it's like a secure service through the web service. It just it's HTTPS, which makes it just an added level security through that company. Every company is a little bit different, but that lock is like an encryption promise that each company has. It's a secure website. It's a secure website. That's the website that you hopefully were intending to go to. Question about the burglary. Yes. Call volume, a series of calls that are happening, but we don't respond. You 
each and every one. Um, a lot of people do too in neighborhoods. When the alarm goes off, um, you'll get the call. Have your neighbor go check real quick. Is everything just the outside? Everything good? We, we, we'll go to the burglar alarms and there's neighbors already there. They're very good. Everything's good. I walked through the house already. Like, <laughs> all right, because it's that quick. Because you're getting a call immediately. From, from, from there, it has to jump. It's just the, the nature of it. Hope that answers my question. Yes? Uh, Mike, Window sensors like the burglar system and just fire system can they be hardwired to police the burner and fire the burner? So not directly hardwired, no. There are anybody it has to go to a central monitor system, whatever company you use. <coughs> Nothing is directly hardwired to the police department. Like your smoke alarms don't come to the police department. That's through it. Oh, okay. But fire department, whatever. So some places have fire. I said off time, but the fire department, if your house starts to be your fire sensor goes off and goes to the fire department. Yes. Okay. We don't have it for, for burglar alarms, no. Okay, but the burglar alarms, no. No. That has to go through like a server. Yes. It has to go to either ADT or, or something to save or whatever company you choose. Any other questions?